Welcome to the Voice of Bold Business Radio, the show about ways to stay competitive in a changing market, break through business plateaus, and respond to the changing expectations of today's customers. Your host, Jess Duell, is a rapid growth entrepreneur, consultant, and business advocate with a 20-year track record of business excellence. She candidly discusses how to achieve your growth strategy and realize your company's unfulfilled potential. Now, here's Jess. Welcome to the Voice of Bold Business Radio. I'm your host, Jess Duell. And you're in the right place for conversations about needs that we as business leaders face today regarding technology, changing customer expectations, as well as quickly changing marketplaces. This program is about what it means to read our reach our short-term goals and still build confidence about our long-term positioning. This program is 240 and it's named Strategic Differentiation. This is kind of an interesting one because I could have the t this be the title of every single show of the Voice of Old Business Radio. <laughs> so as you're listening, you never know what twists and turns we may take or what you're thinking about when you think about strategic differentiation. Our amazing guests today, Patty and Jade, are going to be talking to us about that. And we're going to be having a dialogue as well as they're going to just give us some good information to take away. So let me introduce you to the two of them. Patty House is a conversion copywriter. She is a powerhouse. And when it comes to copy email funnels and strategy that holds it all together, you want her on your team. Her secret power is writing copy for your customers that your customers actually want to read all the way to the end and then click. She does this through intense research and she sprinkles in humor along the way. Also with us is Jade Alexander, founder of Synergy Videography, and they provide stress-free on-site uh, videography and post-creation tools and techniques that you know, you know you can not have to worry about. It's about the stress-free experience that they capture your unique brand, your presentation, your key material that will establish trust and creatively share your message in your marketing channels. Jade and Patty, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah, all right, so we're gonna just jump right in. And I, we're gonna just start with this because I know I wanna know this most. Patty, how well do you strate strategically differentiate from your competition and how do you, how clear is your strategy? for this? So, I mean, I'm a copywriter, so obviously I'm going to say communication is key because I think that the only real way to differentiate yourself, um, be, you know, between yourself and your, and your competition is how well your messaging reaches your, your target audience. Um, you know, being different really isn't enough to have different products really isn't even enough. You have to communicate how well your product, unique or not, um, will help your prospective customers solve whatever problem it was that led them to you. I think that where customers or companies go wrong in communication is when they're afraid to communicate in a way that's different than their, than their competition. And all too often we have, you know, a whole niche of, of, you know, organizations and they all have exactly the same messaging or pretty damn close. You know, they have very similar websites. They have really similar um, product pages, similar sales pages, and that leads their customers zero reason to buy from them. So I think it's really about like knowing what it is that your target audience wants and needs from you and then using that not being afraid of being too unique or of, you know, standing out because if you are really writing for your target audience, you can't write, you can't be wrong. You know, maybe you're, you know, not saying you, you shouldn't have decent grammar and stuff like that, but, but really when you, when your messaging matches exactly what your target audience needs from you, you're golden. Thanks Patty. Jade, how well does Synergy Videography strategically different differentiate from your competition 
And do you feel like your strategy is clear? That is a really great question, Jess. And what we did in our initial strategy is we looked at what the public and our potential clients had experienced previously with other companies, um, what their likes and dislikes weren't. And we, we really looked at what are people needing from this type of company that they're not getting. And uh, a lot of it came down to them owning their own content. You know, they put all this time and effort into creating these videos and the videographer technically owns all of them. So there's this like kind of pressure that you have to keep going back to the same videographer to get different cuts or to get some of their footage for a different reason. And the fact of the matter is it's their content, it's their brand, and it should belong to them. And you're being paid to, to capture this. So, you know, make sure that the client has it. And the other thing we really noticed was that people with stage fright or even um, speakers that are used to speaking all day long and that are excellent at it, they didn't get the, the feedback from uh, their videographers on how did it look? How did it sound? Are they reusing the same words? Should they say it differently? Should they work on their pacing? And we provide an active dialogue and direction as you're going through to make sure that you have kind of the best experience. So we're a bit more than just set up two cameras and, and tell you to go for it. You know, we really do give you um, engagement and feedback as we're recording. And that was something we found that was not really done in the marketplace. I tell you what, I like having both of these perspectives here. This is why we have this type of, of program. So let's start with this, knowing that, um, my question is when you did this original research and when you recognize or you decide to go out and go, oh man, now we're the same as everybody else. We had no idea. Um, we weren't clear internally because we decided that we wanted to not be. And so how, what are the steps to get clear about what we need to do and what really makes us different? What, is, what does that exploration look like so that um, we can really understand what we have and, and tie it to our mission? From my perspective, doing some in-depth voice of customer research and finding out, you know, asking like the hard questions and really digging deep and finding out exactly what people need to get from your product and from your company is the only way to go. I think you have to, you have to basically put yourself in the shoes of your ideal consumer um, so that you know what it is they need to get from you. And then you target all your messaging around that. Uh, that's actually a really great advice, um, Patty, yeah. for sure. Um, I know for us, it was a combination of talking to various types of, of business coaches or people that are in that kind of profession to as a soundboard um, to kind of see what their commonalities were. So we listened to all their feedback and then took it out on a broad spectrum and figured out what the, the median was for that. But really what we did is we went to find people and there's even some people in this room that I'm talking about here who had awful experiences with companies and find out what, what went so wrong. And to, I mean, it's really who I like to work with best is because in a way it, it kind of is a little bit of, you know, it makes it up to them a little bit that, you know, that this profession doesn't have to have that, that experience always attached to it. And the thing is this industry is a need. So to find out why they're unhappy, why they had a bad experience and how we're different and how we can honor that promise is really what helps us with our retention more than anything else. And then they like you, they talk to other people in their, their sphere. And that's, that's been what's worked for us best. Mm -hmm. She was talking about me. <laughs> yes. I have had two very bad experiences and three where I didn't know I didn't own my content until rubber met the road. And so that was, that was fascinating to me. And then I called Jaden. I'm like, is this normal? She goes, no, this is not normal. Well, or yes, this is normal, but not with me. Right. And I was like, <laughs> you know, right. So it's all in what you say and how you say it. So there's a perfect example of an illustration where I'm like, Jade, is this right? And what Patty is saying is coming into play. She's like, well, yeah, it is right. And we don't do it that way. We do it this way instead. And there's that differentiation, that, that uniqueness that then can be, uh, you know, played out. 
I know there's a strategy for everything these days. And so when we think about strategy for differentiation and for marketplace, um, you know, marketplace printed penetration for new products or new clients or new whatever, whichever part of the ANSOF matrix we might be referencing or going after long term, we still have this concept of, well, we've got to have a strategy for it. So how do you, you know, how do you look at this concept for, we've got to have a strategy for it when it comes to this competitive advantage? Because what we're talking about today, strategic differentiation is competitive advantage. <laughs> well, I think that ideally, a strategy comes from what it is that your customers need. What do, you, what do, you, what do consumers really need from you? Um, and that's where your strategy comes from. So, you know, creating a hierarchy of needs and, um, you know, overcoming objections and knowing, you know, again, it's, it really comes down to knowing your, your customers so in depth that you really, you, you understand what problems are, they're facing, you know um, what they want to get from you, you know what they're, you know, what they did for, you know, their last vacation almost, maybe not quite that much, but really you do, you know them really in depth and you use that to create a strategy. And I mean, you know, when it comes to communication, like strategy is something you, you can't just create. You have to, you have to know all those things you have to know, you know, their problems, their, um, you know, what they're striving to achieve. And that's when, and that's when you, you know, you kind of create a strategy around that. So what we found is uh, the best strategy for us was to ask the right questions when uh, we are contacted or going um, to speak with certain types of, of potential clients. And so whatever their questions might be, we always address them and then we ask questions of our own to make sure more than anything that we're the right fit. We don't want them to work with somebody that is not gonna be good fit for them. And we most certainly don't wanna waste their time or money by not being the right option. So it really helps us to make sure that we're working with the right type of clientele and that we're fulfilling their needs right off the bat. Instead of trying to fit ourselves into this, this box that we're never gonna fit into, we make sure that yes, that is a box that we're accustomed to being in, or that's not really something that we can do. And that really helps us with our strategy to you know, ask the questions and create that dialogue. You're putting yourself in a box. You're saying some people, we don't wanna work with you. You're saying some people, we aren't the right fit for you. And that's, that's hard to do these days. It's hard to do in a time and a place where a company and a service and a product are looking to grow and reach these certain things. And we have to play these games a little bit sometimes, and we don't want to put ourselves in a box. Have you been, and, and this is for, you know, in, in general, have you been happy with the box that you've created, Jade? And then Patty, I'm curious your, you know, your insight and what a story you would have around that would be if you have a success story from a company where you put them in a box for lack of a better description. Well, that's, that's always hard to, to have an artist say, like, I want to be inside the box because we're always taught, think outside the box. Um, yeah. But there's still a box. So, and if your clients exist in that, then that's where you need to be. We actually have a variety, if you want to think of it like, um, like those little gift boxes that you get that have box inside a box inside a box. We have several options that we are comfortable working within and provide various options for our clients. But when we have to custom build things, of course, it's like custom building your own box, that's fine. But we have designed on our end what we are best at, what we can provide the best service for, and that we are 100% confident in doing. And if you have that box that needs to be filled and we're the right size for that, then perfect, that works out. If we're not, let's not break your box or have the contents inside be too small and paddle around or whatever. I don't know, I'm not in the shipping industry, but you know, making sure that the right tool for the right job. Yeah, and, and you know, from my perspective, I actually just finished a project where we decided to be really, you know, kind of polarizing in the copy. Um, this was a client who had a, 
um, he had a course in sales training. So basically teaching sales professionals how to be better at their job. And, um, you know, what we found out during the, the research phase was that so many people felt like if they were an introvert or not like a natural salesperson, that they were really, um, you know, less likely to be successful. And so we went, we went all in on being really polarizing. And we actually said that this training is not for those extroverts. It's actually for introverts who, um, you know, who are not born kind of naturally gifted at, you know, gabbing. Um, and so, you know, hard to say exactly how it's going to work because it's just going out, but, but I feel like it's, you know, it's like you're drawing a line in the sand and you're saying, you know, I don't work with everybody. I work with these specific people and I am kick-ass at working with these specific people. And I feel like that's, you know, it's, it's a little bit scary sometimes to go all in on one niche, but I think it can be really, really successful for people. True. And it's worth taking the challenge, isn't it? I mean, something that in at Red Direction, we have claimed to be industry agnostic, and we are. Our specialty is not in an industry that has, as a vertical industry, our specialty is in a horizontal segment of that market. When you reach a certain size and you want to get to a different size, there's a period where, yes, we will be a fit for you. And there's a period when we won't be a fit for you anymore within the growth of your organization. And we like that. We like that. And that, that and that's a fascinating because people are like, how do you do that? It's not a niche. I'm like, it is, it's just not a niche you agree with. <laughs> and that's actually, so let's say that, right? We hear these business models. We hear all of these things. We are recognizing the power in knowing exactly who we work with and who we serve the best because it prevents dilution of our brand. It prevents the, uh, the erosion of our credibility on a broader playing scale. And so when you find companies that you walk into, and for Jade, this would be like when you have to ask better questions of them. And for Patty, I think this, I think this is going to be when you have to tell them <laughs> they're being all things to all people and they got to get out of their rubber stamped approved stuff and actually say something, right? When you're in those situations, uh, how do you, how do you recognize it? And what is the first step to get the buy-in and the consensus building needed to move forward? Oh, I think from my perspective, um, you see, you can see immediately if you have watered down copy. Um, you know, that's kind of what I call it. Um, you can see it right away. It's just generic headlines that could be selling any product to any person. Um, and the way I get buy-in is when I am done this research phase, I actually present all of it to my, to my clients before, before we actually go ahead and do the writing. So I would show them that this is exactly what your your current customers are saying about you. Um, and this is what what's leading them to you and really just kind of get the buy-in that way where you're actually showing evidence. Um, it works exceptionally well. I've never had anybody push back and say, I don't agree with this. Um, they actually really find it a lot. It's almost like you're empowering your clients to, to be okay with getting out of their box almost, you know? Yeah. That's true. Some cases we are in the wrong box. We're not in the box of who we can help and what our true message is. We're in the box of this is what we've decided to do. So that's what we're going to do. Yeah. And it's a way too big of a box usually. It's yeah. Oh yeah. Box. And it should be, it's like wrapping up a ring in a, in a, you know, the box, the size of like a kid's, um, you know, toy bed. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Like it's like way too big and it needs to be like a little tiny, preferably, you know, pale blue box, you know, from Tiffany's. Like that's yeah. what. Intrigue. <laughs> I'm so glad the box analogy is like <laughs> morphing. That's great. <laughs> so um, to address your question, I'm going to use another analogy. We're going to take a hard left turn away from boxes. And the way that we can kind of gauge and figure out you know, is this a good fit? Are they going to get great um, service and what they're needing from us or is it not? 
it's very close to when you have a friend or a neighbor say, hey, can you walk my dog? And you're like, oh yeah, sure, I can walk your dog. I like dogs, dogs are nice. And then it goes from, hey, can you walk my dog to, can you dog sit for me in your house for two weeks and cook them raw, you know, the raw chicken and give them the rice and make sure they go out two times a day. It's no longer just walking your dog. It's something completely else that they're wanting. And at that point, they want a boarding shelter or they want you to adopt their dog. And if that's not what you're doing, if you're just a nice neighbor, you can kind of tell that that's not a good fit. And by that, you definitely, we take the route of, we don't want you to invest in something that's not going to work out for you. And we find somebody that all they want is somebody to walk their dog, maybe give it some chicken after the walk, you know, that's fine. You know, we say, yes, we would love to help you. We are a good fit for you. Um, and here are your steps from, from there. It's just, it's going to be painless for everybody at that point, because you don't have to either go up or down from your standard. Your standard is high enough as it is having to manipulate that affects your quality control. It affects your product in the end. And for us, we are an audiovisual company, so people can see what we do. And if they see what we do and they want that, or they see our examples and they want that, then that, that makes sense. It's great. If they're seeing something and they want something else and it's not in our wheelhouse, we recommend that they, you know, find somebody that that is their wheelhouse instead of trying to conform, you know, the whole nonconformist, try and mold yourself into something that you're not. Make sure they get to someone that they need to be with, you know, if it's that, what is that? If you love them, let them go kind of thing, because you want them to get what they need. And if that's not with you, then that's okay. You are listening to the voice of Bold Business Radio. This is program 240, Strategic Differentiation. We'll be right back after this. You are listening to the voice of Bold Business Radio. In every program, we share stories, tips, and concepts that benefit short-term goals and increase confidence in long-term positioning. For additional perspectives on your growth strategy, Jess Duell is your business advisor and consultant. Go to voiceofboldbusiness.com and click the Find Out More button to get started. Now, back to Jess. We have been talking with special guests, Patty House and Jade Alexander. And I have to tell you, Patty's experience in conversion copywriting and Jade's experience in the field as a service provider and videographer have really shaped this conversation in a unique way specifically because we are talking about uniqueness. What's in and what's out for us? When is it in and when is it out? And can we be open to the idea that something we think is in actually ought to be out? I mean, those are some of these conversations and they're not easy answers and they take time to consider gathering information, having conversations that we may not want to have. And so as we go in for the little synopsis being done, as we go into the second part of the program, I wanted to start with this. When we find that, or how about this? When you find that the edges of what you do are being bumped into, and this could be like playing off of the dog analogy that Jade shared, a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, and all of a sudden we're like, we're uncomfortable and we don't know why, and if we stop to think, we're, oh, we're not in our lane anymore. We're outside of what we know we can do profitably with the level of service and the quality that we want in our organization and whatever other values you use in your organization. So what do you, what do, you do when the edges of what your service, your product offering does no longer serves your client? Well, I think that a couple of things. I think one is that no is a complete sentence and you're totally okay with saying no if something is outside of your wheelhouse and you're just not comfortable with it. Um, but I also think that, you know, your business is going to grow. It's going to evolve. It's going to change. You know, when I first started copywriting, I was just a copywriter. Um, and now I do a lot more strategy and that's okay. Right. You know, it's kind of, um, it's an evolution that I feel really confident about because it didn't happen overnight. I didn't, you know, I didn't work on my first project. And then somebody said, Whoa, can you create this whole final strategy was not at all like that. And that would never have been good. But I think 
I think, you know, you have to do things that, that are out of your comfort zone as an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, your comfort zone is, is, you know, probably not the best place to stay for very long as an entrepreneur. And you really have to be okay with making those hard decisions. But again, it's also okay to say, no, I don't want to do this. I don't think it fits with my values or it doesn't fit with my skill set. I think it's totally okay. And I think that's actually empowering to say, no, I, we're not a good fit. And then, you know, invite them to find somebody who's a better fit for you. I loved all of that. <laughs> I was like, queen. <laughs> that was great. Um, you know, I have a client that teaches this idea of JDY. And it's called Just Do You. Because all you can do is what you have and what you are. If you give it everything you have, then that's all you can do. So just do you. And um, I love her. Her name's Carrie Knudsen. She has a lot of these types of acronyms that, that you have. I mean, I don't know if it's an acronym. It doesn't make a complete word. I don't know. The copywriter's here to help me with that. But she has these, these cute little things like that. But they're great to remember because, yes, you should definitely be putting yourself um, outside your comfort zone to learn. Learning is great and continuing education is never wasted. Um, and when you're at a place that you can't handle it, you're not comfortable with it, it's not your lane. What we've always done, and we have a, a crew of a bunch of very talented people in a lot of different ways, is if none of us can handle it, then we go to somebody like Jess and we ask our questions and we say, hey, we don't know how to handle this. And that might be a simple question of, okay, this person's the best at it, go have them do additional training, or no one in your, in your um, organization is capable of doing that, so outsource it, and let's find a way that makes sense for you. As an entrepreneur, it's hard because we wear so many hats, and we have to know, we feel like we have to know everything, but that's just not possible. So just do you, just do as much of you as you can, and then where you can't, find somebody else, either within your organization or outside of it, and if you have no idea what the problem is, get with Jess. She will look at that and she'll be like, oh yeah, yeah, here's, here's the part that you're missing right here. Um, and here's how to fix it. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. We humans as a society, we are a society. We want to be engaging with other people and we want to help each other. Now help each other doesn't mean do it for free, but it, it does mean to be there to support each other. And the small business community is all about helping each other. Because when we survive, we all survive. And so it's in our best interest to help each other. And that's generally the kind of feel that I've always gotten from it. <sighs> right there. That's why you're both on this show. <laughs> right there. And by the way, thank you for that, Jade. I was not expecting that. So I'm going to say, wow. wow, look at that. I got a little bit of a kudo right here on the show. And I am pleased as punch. Well, it's not because I'm on the show, but it's because it's something you've actually done for us where it was very evident that everyone in my organization was not capable of handling a specific problem. And you're like, Hey, I can fix that. And then that was like, Oh, okay, great. <laughs> now is that yeah. right. Sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not, but it's always moving forward. That's a big thing. Thank you. Something. Okay. This conforming, I wrote this down because I didn't want to forget this uh, conform as a nonconformist. So when we're, um, let's say for those listeners out there, you consider yourself a mission or a heart-based or a heart-centered business. For some of you out there, you're out there for growth and revenue and what that brings. And, and for others of you, you're, you want to make a difference, but you really just want to feel fulfilled along the way, right? There are all of these different ways in this spectrum of, of what we can do. And as an artist or as somebody who wants to be authentically themselves, the just do you, and know when to say no, because no is a complete sentence. Loved both of those bits. And so when does it make sense? Because we do conform as a nonconformist, as individuals, as well as teams, when we decide we're a nonconformist. We still decide how we're going to do something, which makes us conform to ourselves. Or am I missing something there? That's no, I, think, I think you're right. I think for sure we do. We... we you're conforming even as you're saying you're a nonconformist. But I think in a lot of ways we, you know, I, like, I don't know. I don't know if I love the whole phrase, like conforming and nonconforming. I feel like if you're 
being you and you're being true to you and just being you. I love that phrase. Like, I think that that's, that's all the conforming you have to do. You know, I think you have to, you have to do business in a way that serves your own values. Um, even if they're different than other people's values and, you know, we all have different values and I think that that's totally okay. I think it's like, you know, it's really about just being authentic and, and being true to yourself. That's a, that's a really great answer. Um, I think the whole idea of conformist, nonconformist, there's, there's all kinds of pop culture stuff associated with that. But I think that there's a very big difference between conforming and social expectations. And it is okay as a nonconformist to still live within social expectations. And as you think about just the business world, you know, if you are in an industry where you need to be taken seriously, you're not going to show up, you know, in Spanx and a crop top and be like, Hey, give me money. You know, there's still that, that expectation that you show up professionally, you know, you're, as I like to tell my team members, you're clean and you don't smell weird and you're dressed appropriately and you're using proper communication skills and syntax. That is all the expectations socially for us as business owners. That doesn't mean that you can't show up like we do with our dark blue shirts of different cuts and our leggings and our boots and our hair done in, you know, fun, intricate braids or whatever we feel like that day. Um, but we're still fitting into the social expectation with our own spin on it. And that is absolutely okay. And I think that's how you can identify as yourself. And there's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to be exactly like everyone else to be the nonconformist living within the conformity of society because there's those expectations and we have to fulfill those. But there is a fine line where you can literally do your own thing. And I encourage people to do that. I think too, to, to build on that is that, you know, what your audience expects is probably also matters and how you show up socially. Like, you know, I was thinking, um, you know, if, you know, 20 years ago, Hugh Hefner was one of your, you know, prospective clients, you could show up in the, you know, you know, the, the mini skirt and, um, you know, low cut shirt. And that would probably be okay because he would be, you know, okay with it. Um, but I think that, I think that, yeah. And I also think that, that how people show up socially has changed a lot, you know, like it never used to be okay for people to have a whole bunch of visible tattoos. And now it's like so mainstream that that's totally okay. Right. Or same with like multiple piercings or really, you know, fun hair. Like, I think that all of that has become more mainstream in the last, you know, half dozen years than it ever used to be. I'm fascinated by this. We're talking around this. And so I just want to say it out loud, right? We're talking about a differentiation strategy where we are more targeted in our message. We're more targeted in the people that we want to work with, which means we may not have as big of a market share as we would in other facets, right? Like if we were a broom manufacturer and seller, that's very different than copywriting and videography. And it by default, and I don't, maybe brooms find this too. I've not worked with broom manufacturers, so I don't know. And I'll be honestly okay saying, I don't know about broom manufacturing strategic positioning for growing your market share and how you want to do that. So we're talking about being very narrow and focused. And the more narrow and focused we are, the more we are, it's perceived to be left on the table more is perceived to be left on the table. Well, we could have had those, we could have had that, we could go this direction. And so this understanding what our labels are, understanding how our customers think, understanding what draws our employees to us, allows us to create what? It allows us to create this cohesive concept that then we have to figure out how to put into words and action so that Anybody who runs into us anywhere in our hiring process, anywhere in our market expansion for longevity and engagement of employees to longevity and engagement of customers to what other opportunities might come are directly related to how well we have defined those edges. And then because you know what, a new product like 
podcast editing, I'm going to just go with Jade here for a minute. A new product like podcast editing may make sense for Jade, but really in the, is it the right time? Is it the right place? Do we have the right staff? Why is, why is this on the radar? Is it really an opportunity? What, and most importantly, what does it take away from our existing business? And that's where I think most of us fail in this strategic differentiation. We leave things on the table and we don't think about the cost by spreading out or embracing an opportunity before it's fully thought out. And so the, the question then I have for the two of you is what, you know, what situation have you ever found yourself in where that was the case where you were like, oh, I have this opportunity, and if I go there, there's going to be a cost. Did you look at the cost? Did you take it? Did you find, did it work out? Did it not work out? I'm curious about, about that from you. I think for me, I mean, opportunities come up all the time where you're, where you're, you know, it's, for example, I had a discovery call last week, and it was for a guy who was, um, selling something that I didn't agree with and I, I it was kind of against my value system and you know ultimately I I had to I had to turn him away even though you know I did have I had some space coming up in August that I could have slotted in and put him in for and honestly could have made quick money because it wouldn't have been difficult but um, you know it didn't it just didn't work for me um, and and I had to, you know, use my power of the word no. Um, but it kind of hurts a little bit, right? You know, you're like, mm, you know, I could have made, a, you know, good money quickly, but but it just didn't, it just didn't really work for me. Um, and I think that's totally okay. And I and I know it was a lost opportunity, but I'm okay with losing that opportunity. You know, I had um, was a, an opportunity that came up, and uh, one. Of the people I love working with is Gary Barnes and he has this whole segment on the power of yes and agreeing to do things that may not be exactly, you know, what your focus is or what, what your direction is at the time, but what it can become later. So I was invited last year to this thing that they call the um, camp experience. Now, for those of you that don't know me or can't tell by my situation back here, I'm not an outdoorsy person outdoors and I are not a thing not that I don't mind it I've got a bird feeder but I don't want to go live with the birds so this thing was a three-day thing and it was basically summer camp for um, adult female business owners and there were breakout sessions and it was there were arts and crafts I mean it literally was like summer camp all over again um, but when you talk about the cost versus value I of course had to pay for um, myself to go the expenses of going there physically to bringing a staff member, another another videographer, because there was so much going on, I could not do it all by myself. Um, but the biggest thing you have to think of is the time that, that took away from other business that I could have been going for, working on. I mean, your time is literally is money. And so that has to be factored in. But what it turned out to be is I got to meet a very unique niche of people that were my people that I didn't even know about because I would have never gone after them or reached out to them in that group. But being in front of all of them, I dressed up in a squirrel costume uh, for the talent show. My Myself and Lauren were dancing to Beyonce, which again, queen, queen. Um, but we, we danced to that and that was our talent section. We could have done something with videography or photography or something like that, but we just did the Just Do You, which she and I are both dancers and we're both figure skaters. So we threw something together made it work and we remembered and we're actually known as the squirrel girls from that event and we've received referrals and business from it because we decided to go for three days in the middle of nowhere with where and it was also a cost on my body um i'm recovering from an knee injury still and um, that was still last year and so we had to do a lot of hiking a lot of walking and things that i generally avoid um because it's it's strenuous on the knee but that all equated to something really kind of magical that I would have never done. Had you asked me like, do you want to go to summer camp? I'd have been like, no, I'm good. I'm going to stay home. I'm, I'm going to work and watch Hulu. And that's where I'm going to live. And it was something I would have never done without that power of yes. And it worked out to our benefit. <clears throat> so with your power of yes, 
you still went, you evaluated, it sounds like there was an evaluation in there. I don't know these people. Somebody sees something that I don't see. I'm expecting this to help my business in these ways. And then you were able to measure that so that if it didn't work out, you would be able to do that the next time that you had an opportunity come up, right? Yes. Yeah. And so with that then, so you still went through an evaluation process going from yes, yes, yes. and then evaluating it to see what the fit was. Yes. So the question of, do you want to do this thing? It's going to be great. And it was all based off of someone else's reputation that I trusted. So, I mean, again, keep, be aware of who you endorse because it can either be really good or really bad, but this person I trusted and I said, okay, what, what's going on? It was that next weekend. So then once I knew, yes, I can afford it. I have the time to go. Um, everything's going to have to be put on hold, but yes, I can go who can go with me. And based off of those initial costs, what do I need to make to make this all worth? And what it came down to is I measured it after a year of attending and it has been uh, twofold of what I invested and it's still building. So keep your seats, like keep track of everything. So you have a hard number to measure against. It's one thing I did learn from Jess is get real numbers, not estimates and have something that you can physically compare to each other of, yeah, it was absolutely worth it. Or I broke even, or I lost money. And that is the evaluation I had to make in like five days before we went. Do you call that innovation or is that just changing your market strategy for both of you? I'm just curious. <laughs> I think for me, it was a leap of faith. I don't know if that was necessarily innovation or strategy or anything beyond taking advice that I received from somebody else mm -hmm. and doing something that's a one in a lifetime opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that you were, I was chosen out of a handful of people. So yes, is that innovative? Sure. What well, was it innovative really for you in your business? Me. Yes, it okay. was. It was something that a lot of people don't do. They don't go into things, I don't say blindly, but based off of someone else's reputation, you know, just to hop on and say, okay, let me grab a team member and we'll be there in a week, you know, and that type of quick booking, we don't do a lot. A lot of people in our industry don't book that quickly. We did it and we said, yeah, sure. We'll go to this thing. We'll film some butterflies or something. We have no idea what we're filming. Um, but our willingness to be flexible was our innovation. Okay. How, how does innovation fit into Patty, into the work that you do and the companies that you've helped transform their sales and marketing? Well, I think it's, it's innovative to just know who your audience is and not not be stuck in the you know i'm going to i'm going to communicate like everybody else does i'm going to i'm going to follow the the easiest path because i think that that is the easy the easy choice is to do what everybody else is doing but i think when you're when you're you know you know what what matters to your prospects and to your customers i think that's innovative because so few people are doing it what makes it bold to go after this level of strategic differentiation and being clear on that strategy? <laughs> I think what makes it bold is just going for it. Honestly, I think, I think boldness comes from knowing what you want and taking action. Well, I like to think that starting your own business is bold. And I think the current cons uh, census that I saw was um, out of the entire population of the United States, 13.3% of people are entrepreneurs with 500 employees or less. We're 13% of such a small scale. And then to be bold on top of that makes us an even tinier percentage. But that, that just do you, which by the way was Carrie Knudsen, want to make sure that everyone knows that. Um, that just do you mentality means that I'm going to be me. I'm going to provide the service and I'm going to find the perfect fit for them and I. So that way we can have this backbone of America of this 13.3% of us just being awesome and being willing to take that jump in the first place. 
and then to be willing to make this business, do your business and then do these, these bold, crazy things of, you know, go out and do a kayaking trip or fit into a box or write copy that no one else is brave enough or even thought to write. Those are, you have to think of yourself as being bold within a bold group. You heard it here, Patty and Jade, both shared insights, experiences, and their knowledge with us. So how can you, listening to this program, apply it practically to what you're working on today? And by the way, if the answer is yes, you can apply it practically to something you're working on today, this is important. Talk to us about it. Hashtag VBB radio, radio at reddirection.com are both ways to keep in the conversation and to keep the conversation going. So rate us, right? You've got tips, you got stories, you have all of these things. Two wonderful women entrepreneurs that are here today sharing openly and we want to know what you think. We want to hear your feedback because we shape what we do on this program based off of your needs as the listeners. Whether it's Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Facebook, you name it, the platform you're listening to is included in our gigantic distribution network. So rate us, say hello, use hashtag VBB Radio, and consider this question. How do you stay focused on your strategic differentiation. The voice of Bold Business Radio gives you insights about how to achieve your company's growth strategy. Use hashtag BBB radio or email us at radio at reddirection.com to ask questions and share your experiences. Add your voice to the conversation. Together, we define what being an effective leader means today. Special thanks to the Scott Treatment for technical production. Thank you for joining us.